Uh, my name is Mark, and I am one of the pastors here, and it's a privilege to welcome you to our service. As you just saw on the screen, we had a pretty busy and active week here this past week with Forest Cliff Day Camps, uh, running the camp this week at Stony Creek. 140 kids were here, a lot of leaders and counselors, and really excited for all that the Lord did. And so we want to be praying for uh, the seeds that were planted in the hearts of kids this past week, and we are so thankful for the partnership we have with Forest Cliff. I hope you enjoyed some of those uh, videos. Um, a couple of announcements as we get going. Uh, part of being a part of a church family is we understand that those that are coming in, sometimes you have been going through a really hard week and it's really hard for you to even show up. For others, you're on a high and you're excited. You're celebrating what God's doing in your life and things are going really well. And so we grieve and we celebrate together as a church family. And for some, they are grieving. And we want to uh, be praying for Frank Bale and the, the loss of his brother this past Friday. Uh, so let's be praying for him, his brother of 10 years younger than him. So let's be praying for the Bale family as they uh, grieve his loss. We also celebrate. We celebrate new life. And we celebrate Jeff and Amelie Hutchinson giving birth to their uh, daughter, their first child. Uh, I, I th and the name's in my head, Ivy Charlotte. And I think there's, a, is there a picture, Mike? Ivy, they sent in a picture of Ivy Charlotte. So Ivy was born on August the 21st, 7 pounds, 14 ounces, and they posted 41 centimeters tall. So if you're wondering about that. But mom and dad and baby are all doing well, so we want to be praying for them and we celebrate together with them. We also celebrate not just a young couple giving birth to a newborn, but a couple celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Uh, Ross and Jane Hunt are celebrating that on June the 29th. And so we celebrate together with them. If you know Ross and Jane, make sure you send them a note this week or call them this week to congratulate them, to wish them well on their 60 years of being married together. We also have this weekend uh, f about 30 of our young adults who are away on a canoe trip. They're in the northern part of Algonquin. We haven't heard from them. I don't know if there's cell reception up there anyway, and they probably didn't want to do that. But let's be praying for them. They're arriving back tomorrow. So uh, we're trusting that it was a good uh, weekend together of, of canoeing and camping. Uh, next Sunday, I want to let you know we are having a church family barbecue. So right after the service, uh, plan to stick around and we're going to enjoy lunch together. Some good old-fashioned church family picnic games will be taking place. And so just bring a lawn chair and plan to stick around for that. Next Sunday is also Move Up Sunday or Round Up Sunday, whatever you want to call it. The Sunday when all of our kids move up to the next grade level. Uh, and so just parents be prepared for that, particularly if your kids are in the primary wing, you're going to drop them off, some of them in a new classroom. I know my kids are pretty excited about that. Maybe there's some other kids. So just be reminded of that. And then for the grade fives who are going into grade six, you get to be in here the whole time. And I know you're stoked about that. <laughs> so that's next Sunday, Church Family Barbecue and our Move Up Sunday. Now, there's lots of ministry that's going on that's going to be starting up over the next little while. On the screen, you can see a number of ways to keep in touch with what's happening. I'm not mentioning everything that's happening because that would be the whole service. There's a, lot, there's a lot going on, a lot of fall start dates in the back of your bulletin lists, uh, some uh, dates that you can mark your calendar uh, if you are a part of each, any of those ministries. But on the screen as well, four different ways that you can stay in touch. We also have a family brief, a weekly email. I think that's on the screen actually. I can't see back there. Family brief is on the screen. That is a weekly email that we sent out. So there's notices about what's coming up. I also send out a short note. Uh, and so if you don't have that, I'd encourage you to go online and sign up for that. Part of the ministry coming up is for our men's ministry as well on September the 7th. That's a Saturday at 6 o'clock. Uh, the men's ministry is having a hot dog and corn roast. And so bring a lawn chair for that. No charge at all. And last week we heard from George Attrell about Grief Share coming up and Diane Spearing about some primetime stuff. And today we're hearing from Gwen Penny, who is our uh, women's ministry director. And she's going to share a little bit about ladies Bible study coming up this fall. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Mark. Um, this is for the women of the church. Ladies Bible study starts on Thursday, September 12th, um, 10 o'clock in the chapel across the road. We do have 
um, childcare available for preschoolers. And um, we have a book this year, um, it's on the screen there, Psalm 23 is how we're starting our year with a video series by Jennifer Rothschild. We do have a limited number of, of those books available at the Welcome Center. So come and see me or Sally, who's at the Welcome Center today, after, um, after the service if you want to get one of those and uh, we'll get you set up. Thanks. Great, thank you, Gwen. All right, just a little bit. We are, this is a full service today. We're going to be coming around the Lord's table at the end of the service. And in just a few moments after we worship by singing together, we're going to witness a couple of baptisms. Baptism is a public proclamation of your faith in Jesus. So this is two individuals who will be going public with their faith. They've already uh, confessed their sin before God. God's already changed their heart. They've believed on Jesus for their salvation. And they are now going to publicly proclaim that in the waters of baptism, which is what Jesus told us to do. So this is an act of obedience that is a public proclamation of their faith in Jesus. So we're going to celebrate uh, with these two individuals in just a little bit. But before, I, before we do that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura, and she's going to lead us in a few songs together. Good morning. In uh, 1 Chronicles 29, it's recorded for us uh, a prayer that David prays in the presence of a gathering of uh, the people of Israel. It says, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. You The chasm 
to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages set down. I'm 
trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. Good morning. We are excited that we have uh, two uh, people being baptized this morning that we get to be a part of and uh, uh, pray for and just be excited how the Lord is continuing to work in our midst. And so I'm going to... All right, well, amen. We have one other uh, being baptized as well this morning. And I know we have another one planned at some point uh, in September. And so I don't know the date yet, but at some point. And so uh, if that's something the Lord has been working on you, you've been thinking about, make sure to talk to uh, one of us. That would be great. All right, come on down. Yes. Our second being baptized uh, this morning is Andrea. Uh, and Andrea's family is all uh, right here, and so which is uh, great. Uh, and so you guys started joining with us uh, through the live stream, and then have been coming in person for a time now. So I'm going to turn over to you, Andrea, to introduce yourself and share a bit of your God story. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to cry. My name's Andrea Watts. <clears throat> when I was around the age of 10, I gave my life to Jesus, and I have lived with him in my back pocket ever since. I went through my teen and adult life knowing that Jesus was it, always having his voice in my head about right from wrong, not always following his voice. The Holy Spirit was always there. Even though I knew Jesus was it, I was always a lukewarm or surface level Christian. My husband and I just celebrated our 11th wedding anniversary this past summer. Together we have six children, five of whom we get to raise. 
our first child, a sweet baby boy named Bennett, went to be with Jesus when he was 37 weeks, five days, before he ever took a breath of air on earth, before he ever cried, or before we ever got to see his eyes. During this devastating time, I leaned on Jesus. And he showed up. Both Gavin and I always wanted a big family. And growing up, all I wanted to be was a mom who stayed home to raise her babies. Babies, baking, barefoot in the country, and Jesus. That was my dream. Sorry. Thankfully, the Lord provides, and he blessed us with five more children, Julia, Austin, Clark, and in January, twins, Lois and Patrick. Six weeks after we had our fourth child, Clark, my brother died suddenly. Words that I never thought I'd have to say, like words I never thought I'd have to say losing a child. I thought my brother and I and my sisters would be old, rocking in rocking chairs watching our grandchildren. The only thing I knew to do was to pull Jesus out of my pocket and lean on him for peace, healing, and for some kind of hope. And as always, he delivered. He is still working in me in all of those things. Over the past three years, as I've continued to grow and lean on Jesus, he has showed me that I need him every day, not just in the big or small moments, but every moment. So I no longer put him in my back pocket. Jesus is front and center, the place I should have put him all along. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Jean, your mom is going to come and uh, say a few words. Oh, I was fine until I heard my daughter speak. <laughs> you can just hold it. <laughs> yeah. Andrew, ever since you've been a little girl, you've had a heart for Jesus. And today you are taking a step to make a public declaration to tell and confess to the world and all those here of your deep faith and your desire to serve and follow Jesus as your one and only Savior. Jesus will command and control your life, Andrea, and you will be empowered to, have, to live a life of fullness by the, the strength of the Holy Spirit. May your hands always be the hands of Jesus on the earth as you strive to serve Jesus and show his love to others. I pray that that spirit will live within you as you direct your life to grow through the study of his world, of his word. As you raise your children, I also pray that you will have wisdom and knowledge to raise your family according to the basic principles that you live by, the biblical principles you live by. This is a blessing that I prayed over my four children when they were married, and I thought I would repeat it once again to my daughter, Andrea. It is from Numbers 6. 24 to 26. The Lord bless you, Andrea, and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. trusting in Jesus as your Savior. Yes. Upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. Well, let's pray for both Fatima and uh, Andrea. Lord, we are so excited to uh, see how you have shown up uh, in, in uh, their lives this morning, in both Andrea and Fatima's lives. Lord, we, we know, and as we just heard, life is hard. It can be very hard. And the trials and the grieving that come can be unexpected and be terribly difficult. And so, Lord, we thank you, though, that in all 
seasons of life that you work and you act and you are with you, with us. Psalms 46 tells us that you are our refuge and our strength and a very present help in trouble. And so, Lord, we thank you for the promises in your word. Lord, we, we thank you uh, that you have saved both Andrew and Fatima, that you, have, that you have forgiven them of their sin and that they have the hope of eternal life because Jesus came, died, and rose again from the dead. And we have the hope of eternal life because of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray from this day on, and as you've already been working in their lives, that you would continue to walk with them, that they would know your peace, that they would continue, as Andrea shared, to have, have Christ front and center uh, in their lives. And I pray for us as a church that we would continue to pray and, and, and encourage and walk alongside uh, these sisters in Christ. And so, Lord, we, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness and your love for us. Um, we thank you just for the reminder of what baptism is, of, of what Christ has done. And so, Lord, we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said to that, amen. amen. I love hearing stories of what God has done. I love that just God shows up. He shows up in our time of need over and over and over again. I know many of you here in this room can share that same testimony in your own life. I'm going to invite at this time our kids to be dismissed. Grade 1 to 5, we have a program that is geared to you. And so you can head out now. If this is your first time here, please feel free to go with your kids. You can see where they're going and then you know where to pick them up after the service as well. And this will be, for some of them, the last time in those particular classrooms because next Sunday is Move Up Sunday. For those sticking around in here, we are going to come to the communion table and we're going to first spend some time in God's Word. And so I invite you to open your Bible to the book of James. Particularly James chapter 2. I've been mocked or mocked or made fun of or something by a few people of 13 verses today. And they're saying, are you serious? And we will see what happens. But these 13 verses are very much connected together. And you may be wondering, if this is your first time here, normally up here we don't have a giant throne. Uh, this is not common. I have it up here because I want you to imagine for a second that... I asked our treasurer for the top giver in the church. And they told me who it is. Now, just for the record, I do not know what anyone gives, and I don't want to know what anyone gives. I don't want to have, I know in my own flesh, and this is what we're going to be wrestling with today, treating someone different based on some external factor. I want you to imagine for a second, I asked for the biggest giver, the person who gives the most money in the church, and I said, we are creating in Stony Creek the TD Comfort Zone. <laughs> and we're going to put this right there in the front. It's going to block people's view, but we don't care because this person is important because of how much money they give. I've heard of stories of churches that have certain individuals that give one-third to half of their church budget. It comes from one person. And the pastors have shared that when that person wants a meeting, you got to take that meeting. When they want to do something, you got to do that. I want to propose to you that that goes against everything that the scriptures teach. To give that kind of, to show that kind of partiality, to show that kind of favoritism. And I know this is kind of a silly example. It's not an example like if a church ever did this, or had thrones set up for the biggest givers, you need to leave that church. And, and I'm telling you right now, if we do that, you need to leave, I need to leave we just need a complete overhaul. But I want you to imagine for a second, not imagine, I want you to realize that there are ways, even as far-fetched as that example is, there are ways we do this every single day. That we treat people different based on some external factor. And I want you to just imagine for a second that you are a greeter at the door of our church. And in walks a single mom with four kids Maybe she's on ODSP. She lives in government-subsidized housing. And then I want you to imagine right behind her is Elon Musk. <laughs> how are you going to treat Elon Musk versus how are you going to treat the single mom with four kids on government? 
who's in government housing. But Elon Musk can do so much for the church. Imagine if he came to Christ. Imagine the check he could write the church. This is the kinds of things that we go through in our mind to justify being disobedient to what the scriptures say. The scripture says that when someone comes in, it doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. doesn't matter the color of their skin. No one should be treated differently. We all should be welcomed at the foot of the cross and welcomed into the family of God. And imagine how far we would stray if we said, Elon Musk, you sit here. Single mom, you sit in this wooden chair right here. But we do this in subtle ways. And this is what Pastor James is going to challenge us, us with today. As we look at the scriptures, we're going to be looking, Lord willing, at these 13 verses as we lead into communion together. I have a little bit different Bible. I am going to read out of the NLT again today, partly because I think it's a little bit easier to understand. And I know we have a lot of people in our church who are new to the faith and who are new and growing as believers. And this... I find this translation uh, comes across in ways that make sense a little bit quicker than it might be if I were to read the ESV today. And so I'm going to use the NLT. I'm not moving permanently to it, but I really appreciate the way that the NLT translators translate these passages together. So we are going to work through this passage. And what we are going to see is much of what James is challenging the church with here is what Paul was challenging the church in Corinth when they were coming around the Lord's table in inappropriate ways. They were not being considerate of others. When Paul writes that passage we often read at communion, uh, the church was in the, having communion in the context of a love feast where people would bring food and eat it together. But certain people were eating all of the food before other people could get there. They were not being considerate of others. They were showing partiality and Paul calls them out on it. And essentially says, how dare you take the Lord's Supper in such an unworthy manner that you're not even considering your brother or sister in Christ. And so as we come to the Lord's table, this is going to be our challenge from James here today. That the way we treat others says a lot about our character. It says a lot about what's happened already in our hearts. And if you are showing partiality in any way, if you are being inconsiderate of others, if you are treating someone else better because of some external factor, then this is something that we, James is going to tell us, need to repent of. So here it is, James chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he says this, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? And so right at the very beginning, you get the, the heart of James. So I put on the screen a little, little heart. You get the heart of James here as a pastor, my dear brothers and sisters. And again, it's coming across as not how dare you, but, but, but you're, you're missing out on life to the fullest. You're missing out on life as it's meant to be lived. And so Pastor James is going to call us out in, in areas of our lives where we are missing the joy that comes in life living obedient to the scriptures. And so he calls out in particular, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ who left his throne in heaven to be placed in an animal feeding trough. Who humbled himself. Our glorious Lord, the God of the heavens and the earth who came to this earth in human form, fully God, fully man, to die on a cross for you. How can you claim to say you have faith in him if you live in a way that's so contrary to him? And this is what he said, if you favor some people over others, your translation may say partiality. It's the idea of, it literally means to turn your face towards someone, which means to turn away from someone else. And so you turn your face to someone based on some external factor. So someone who is dressed in what is a $3,000 suit, you treat them a little differently than someone who maybe is on, the, on Dundas Street in London with a sign holding up asking for money. And why do we treat them differently? I don't know. There are probably multiple reasons. Oftentimes it's because we think that person can do something for us. Why do we treat a wealthy person better? We think, well, look at the uh, churches have a, have a bad tendency of doing this. Well, look at how much money they might be able to put on the offering plate. So let's treat them a little bit better. 
or name dropping. Have you heard that before? So Elon Musk comes in and you're like, I'm going to selfie with Elon Musk and post it on social media because that gives you something. For selfish reasons, we treat others better than someone else based on some external factor. And this is what James is calling out. Essentially saying, like, you, you can't, as followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot be people who do this. And he goes on to give an example. For example, suppose someone comes to your meeting and the word there is synagogue. So you're gathering together as the Lord people. Suppose someone comes in dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry. Another comes in and poor, who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can sit over there or there's a floor right here for you. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? What is he telling us here? That this kind of partiality that we have a tendency to do, to show partiality in this way, to favor someone else, it doesn't just begin with the eyes, it begins in the heart. With the motives that you have, the thoughts that you have. And so it it's evidence as flowing out of what we studied last week. It's evidence of a heart that isn't in tune with the heart of God. Because the Lord is one who does not show partiality. This is the, if you have notes, I have notes in front of you. The, the wisdom that we're going to hear today. Number one is a don't. It's don't show favoritism. Don't do this. Because it's inconsistent with God's nature. It's inconsistent with Jesus. Remember Peter, he, he was with the Gentiles, particularly with, with Cornelius. And at the end of Cornelius, this Gentile, he says, Now I know that you are a God who does not show favoritism, but accept all those who fear him. And so the Lord is one who does not show favoritism. In fact, all of history is pointing us forward to the day. And we all look forward to the day when every tribe, nation, language, and tongue around the throne are worshiping the Lamb. And we're moving toward that day. That's the heart of God. And so when we don't live consistent with that, James is going to say we are sinning. He's pretty blunt in what he says. But he shows it starts with the heart. With evil motives, selfish motives, motives that are looking out for yourself and what that person can do for you. Verse 5, he goes on and says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. So not only is it inconsistent with the character of God, but it is dishonoring to the poor. It's dishonoring to other people who may not measure up in your eyes, who don't have the external factors that you are looking for in a friend or in someone that you want to hang out with. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you to court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? The, the word there is honorable. And so you have this connection between dishonoring the poor and bearing the name of Jesus, whose name is noble, whose name is Honorable. So why is he telling us not to show favoritism? Every man and the woman and child is made in the image of God. Every man, woman, and child is made in the image of God and is deserving of respect, deserving of, has, has intrinsic value because of being made in the image of God. And so every life is worth protecting whether that life is in the womb or not. Every life is worth valuing. There's not a single person in this room that we can write off. But every person made in the image of God. And so when we bear the name of Jesus, we don't show partiality. And when you do, you look nothing like Jesus. This is what James is telling us here. Then in verse 8 he goes on and says, yes, indeed, it's good. So first point, don't show favoritism. 
Point number two, that's the don't. Now he's moving into the do. And he says, do instead obey the royal law. And I love that. He says this, yes, indeed, it's good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. This is blunt James right here. You're just flat out, you are sinning if you're favoring someone else over another. You are guilty of breaking the law. Meaning you are a sinner if you don't obey the royal law. Law. And I love that title. He calls it the royal law. Why the royal law? It's the law that's supreme above all others. Jesus says the law and the prophets are summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That love your neighbor as yourself actually comes from the book of Leviticus. It's not new with Jesus. But what is interesting in the book of Leviticus is the way the Jewish rabbis interpreted that. The Jewish rabbis interpreted Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself, as only including the Jewish people. That's who the neighbor is that God's talking about is the Jewish people. And so it gave them permission to hate those who were outside of the Jewish faith. And this is why, if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, that parable that Jesus tells, it's in, you see the, the heart of the Jewish people in the question that's asking where Jesus Quotes that very thing I just said of love your neighbor. The, the law is summed up in love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And this rich person, this person says, this Jewish person says, well, who is my neighbor? That's exactly the question that the Jewish rabbis were answering. But then Jesus goes on to tell the story of a good Samaritan. A man who, the Jewish man who's beaten on the road and the one who helps him is not the Jewish leaders. But the good Samaritan, the Samaritan man, the man who the Jewish people considered as half-breeds and the whole history and all of that. The, the anger and the animosity that they had toward each other. They hated each other. And Jesus says, well, who is the neighbor to the beaten Jew? And you can see the Jewish person in that story can't even say the word Samaritan. He just says, well, the one who had mercy on him was the neighbor. And so Jesus is emphasizing and James is reminding the church here that if you want to know who your neighbor is, look around. It is everyone you see, everyone you come in contact with. They're your neighbor. And we are called by God to obey the royal law, meaning to love them as yourself. And when we fail to do that, he flat out tells us we are sinners and we are guilty before God. And you can kind of push back and say, oh, come on, it doesn't seem that bad, is it? But then James, it's almost like James is anticipating the pushback. Because look what he says next. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as the person who's broken all of God's laws. Like, we are so quick to be like, oh, I'm not as bad as that person. But James reminds us what is the truth. That when we break even one sin, we break even one law, we are sinners and we stand condemned before God. And we stand condemned before God the same way a person who has lived their whole life sinning stands before God. Someone who you may look at and be like, wow, they are the big sinners. They're the chief sinners. You stand just as guilty before God as they do. And this is why it is good news that Jesus came. The good news of great joy that Jesus came to rescue us from the punishment of our sin that we deserve. And this, so he goes on to say that for this same God, verse 11, who said, you must not commit adultery, also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you've still broken the law. Every one of us stand guilty before the holy God. And we are helpless to do anything about it. And that's why Jesus came. To do what we could not do ourselves. To die on the cross, paying the punishment that we deserved because every one of us stand guilty before the holy God. Verse 12, so whatever you say, whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. 
There'll be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. He, he, he reminds us that there is a day coming when we will stand before God and have to give an account. He's pointing us forward to judgment day. That there is a day that every one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, every one of us will have to stand before God and give an account of how we lived our lives. So he goes on to say, live in light of that day. And part of living in light of that day is not showing partiality. Part of living in light of that day is loving your neighbor as yourself. Actively pursuing, the word is agape there. Actively pursuing how you can love someone else. Putting their interests ahead of your own. And so pointing us forward to living in light of that day when Jesus is going to return. And he says here something very interesting. He says, if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. And, it's, and you have to read that in the context of what we studied last week. And so what this is telling us is you can tell a lot about a person by the mercy they show to someone else. That if you don't show mercy to someone else, it's evidence that your heart hasn't been transformed by the power of the gospel. That you haven't received mercy from God. You haven't experienced that. Forrest Gump said you can tell a lot about a person by their shoes. James says you can tell a lot about a person from the way they treat other people. Particularly how they treat other people who cannot do anything in return for you. It's evidence. The mercy you show to someone else is evidence. That you have been transformed by the power of Jesus. That your heart is beating along with his heart. We have been shown such great mercy. And this is what we are going to celebrate as we come around the Lord's table. The mercy that God has shown us in the sending of Jesus to come. And the good news is it doesn't even end in mercy, but there's grace too. You know the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is not giving to someone what they deserve. And we praise God for the mercy that we have been shown by God. Grace is giving someone what they don't deserve. And so not only do we not have to suffer the punishment that we deserved, but we are given by the living God a relationship with Jesus, eternal life, both now and forevermore. And a person that has been transformed by the gospel, that's going to be evident in the way they treat others. Every man, woman, and child in this room made in the image of God. You remember that parable? I'm going to close with this as we end, lead into communion. Remember that parable that Jesus told? It's just one verse. And it's actually, I'm going to put it on the screen. and We can read it. I'm just going to read it from the screen. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. Oftentimes that gets, gets interpreted in in a way in which Jesus is the treasure and he's worth giving up everything for. And that is true elsewhere in scripture. But you remember when my, I don't, some of you were around when my mentor, the, the pastor who, who, who mentored me, he preached on this passage. And he helped me see this passage in a different light when he shared that Sunday. So often that gets translated as, you know, Jesus is the treasure worth giving up everything for. But, but what do you have to sell to get Jesus? Nothing. It's a free gift given to us. We don't have to go sell anything. We come to him and accept his gift. And so what he, what Ernest Kennedy, that was his name, uh, is his name. He's still alive. But he shared with us, I think, what is a better understanding of this passage. And what a better understanding of this passage is. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. Who's that treasure? You are. And who is the one who gave up everything for you? God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, gave his life on a sinner's cross for you. This is the value that every one of us has before the living God. That you are the treasure that he pursued. When it comes to our salvation, did we pursue Jesus? Or is it more accurate to say he pursued us? 
Jesus pursued us, and this parable points us to that. And so if there's any area of our lives where we are showing partiality, we are living in a way that is inconsistent with the way of Jesus, inconsistent with the character of God, inconsistent with the treasure that every person is who has come to Christ in faith. When we come around the communion table, we remember what Jesus did, the mercy that he showed, the grace that he bestowed. And we ask him to reveal areas in our lives where maybe we have not been living consistent with the gospel. And if this is an area, if you have been treating someone or people in different ways based on some external factor, the invitation we have as we come to the communion table is rep to repent before God for that and to ask him to give you a new heart, to transform your heart, that your heart will start to beat for others the way God's heart beats for them. So I'm going to pray. The worship team is going to come up. They're going to lead us. And if you need to spend some time in prayer preparing for communion, please, please feel free to do that. After, as we sing, the ushers are going to hand out the bread. And I'm going to invite you to hold that bread. And we will then, I'll come back up and lead us in taking it together. So let me pray first. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for Pastor James writing to these scattered churches. Challenging them in all of these areas. And I pray for us as a church family that we would know that these verses are also written to us. And I pray that we would repent of those areas of our lives where we have been showing favoritism, where we have been showing partiality. Give us a love for all people regardless of any external factor, knowing that all are made in your image. And Father, we are so grateful as we come around the communion table to be reminded of the mercy and of the grace that you have given to us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for his willingness to come to this earth and to give his life for us. And I pray that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to know how we can live in light of these truths as we go out from here. But Father, for anyone who needs to repent, I pray that you would bring these things to our minds, that we would have the courage to repent of these things before you. And God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus, for not just the example he was for us, but for the substitute. He was for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. They are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest of us.
but riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Amen. Christmas time we celebrate and part of the Christmas story is the announcement of the angels and the angels are like super excited and they show up in the sky. They're so excited to tell the shepherds good news of great joy. And what is the good news of great joy? That a Savior has been born. Why are they so excited? Because every one of us stand guilty before God. Every one of us are sinners and deserving of punishment, deserving of eternal separation from God. But Jesus showed up to change that. Jesus showed up and took our place on the cross. And this is what we remember when we come to communion together. We remember that we are lost apart from him. We were lost, but Jesus showed up. We stand guilty before the holy God, but we can know forgiveness and new life through Jesus Christ by believing in him. So this is what we remember. It's his name we bear as we go out into the world. And I pray that our heart would beat along with his heart. Jesus with his disciples took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body I am giving for you. And he gave it for every one of us who have come to him in faith. And he said, eat this in remembrance of me. So let us now together do the same. invite the servers to come forward. They're going to distribute the cup. And again, hang on to that. I'm going to come back up and we will take that together.
Jesus, when he was with his disciples, he took the cup and he poured it. And this would have been the third cup they would have drank together. And it's the cup of redemption. It's the cup that looked back to when his, God's people were enslaved in Egypt. And he redeemed them. And the promise associated with the third cup was when God said to his people, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will rescue you out of slavery in Egypt. And Jesus took this cup and he pointed it forward to himself, whose outstretched arms would be nailed for us. His blood would be poured out for us, not to save us from Egypt. but to save us from the power and the punishment of sin and death itself. Praise be to God that when we were lost, standing condemned and guilty before God, God himself in the person of Jesus showed up. And he took our place. He was our substitute on the cross. And this is what that cup symbolizes Jesus with this cup. He took it with his disciples and he said, drink it in remembrance of me. And so let us now together do the same. The scriptures say every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. And he is coming back. So I want to invite you to stand and we are going to sing and be reminded of that truth today.
I want to thank you for joining with us today. Just two quick reminders for next week. It's Move Up Sunday and a barbecue, church family barbecue. So bring a lawn chair, plan to stick around for that. And then uh, number two, we're going to take a break just for one week from James. And next week we're going to do kind of a standalone on uh, the purposes of the church, the vision of the church according to God's word. Not according to me and my vision that I have for the church, but we want to look at what Christ's vision for the church is. And so we're going to spend one week for kind of fall launch Sunday talking about that. As I close, I want to read from, and this is an intro, I was just reading it while we were singing, a different translation from Revelation chapter 7. This is what all history is moving towards. This is what we just sang about. After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, from every social class. Standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a mighty shout, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God. And this is the song they sang. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Do you look forward to that day? Let's live in light of that day, knowing that he could come back at any moment. We'll see you next week. Maybe.